So uh, environmental stressors such as overgrazing, climate change, drought, you name it, can have significant impacts on, impacts on the way animals behave and respond to those stressors. Uh, for example, animals might change their activity patterns in terms of uh, shelter seeking, mate searching might become a little more difficult, and then energetically expensive behaviors such as migration might, be, uh, might become a little more difficult, necessitating more uh, longer refuel times or uh, delays to those migration patterns in order to adjust to those environmental stressors. However, changes to animal behaviors come with costs. For example, changes to activity in response to a stressor might incur fitness costs, where an animal might change their mating behavior, foraging behavior, um, or defending territory. Changes to activity might therefore incur resource costs where the acquisition of resources might be affected and become reduced. And then of course, changes to resource costs can directly affect the energetic costs, energy that's necessary for an animal to do its daily function. Uh, for example, a lot of species of hummingbirds uh, require an insane amount of fuel and energy uh, for them to do their daily activity and to uh, thermoregulate properly. Thermoregulation, which is important for them to sustain flight and do other activities. And so really, it's thermoregulation that plays a huge role in activity and how an animal mediates their interaction with the environment. Most endotherms will try to maintain themselves within the thermal neutral zone. This is the area where the rate of, of heat production within the animal is nearly equivalent to the rate of heat lost to the environment. The thermal neutral zone is categorized by an upper and a lower critical limit. And it's outside of these boundaries in which the cost of maintaining that optimal body temperature becomes higher. So for example, under cold stress, an animal will increase its metabolic rate by expending more of its resources in order to maintain a constant body temperature across time. Conversely, under heat stress, an animal will also expend more resources to increase metabolic rate in order to lose heat via behaviors such as panting or losing heat via its extremities. Now, both of these behaviors can also influence their activity where under cold stress or heat stress, they might seek out different shelters, um, such as seeking out shade. And so for large animals uh, like us and this buck here with large volumes, uh, large enough to produce a lot of heat and low surface areas, uh, low, low enough to, to not lose a lot of heat, it becomes relatively easy for these animals to maintain a nearly constant body temperature across time, regardless of those costs, assuming that those costs don't, uh, aren't overbearing for the animal. And so we call these animals homeothermic, but even the most homeothermic animals will have slight deviations in their body temperature across time. As humans, you might notice this, especially uh, during the winter and fall months, where when you wake up, uh, you might notice that your body temperature is just a little lower than it was the night before or the day before when you were active. However, for small mammals with a large surface area and a relatively low volume um, to produce heat, it becomes a little harder for them to maintain that nearly constant body temperature and to afford those body temperatures up, uh, with their costs. And so a lot of small mammals have developed a strategy of, called heterotherm, in which their body temperature profiles look a little something like this. During their active periods, when, um, when they're out foraging, they have this active control over their body temperature where they're expending their own resources in order to help fuel those daily activities, such as foraging, mating, defending territory, you name it. However, during inactive periods, they'll loosen some control over their body temperature over to the environment. And this helps them save energy and uh, decrease those costs. These inactive phases are kind of akin to hypothermia or um, induced hypothermia during the night. And again, it helps them save energy. Now, active control over their body temperature is determined and influenced by a plethora of complex decision-making processes by the animal. And a lot of that is determined by risk. And it's just the risk of foraging, the risk of mating, the risk of predation, just any form of risk. Anybody who's ever seen or been around a small rodent will realize how skittish they are. Um, and really what they're doing is just assessing risk to themselves. During those inactive phases, there's a little more influence uh, by the daily temperature and ambient temperature. 
And so it's a mixture of these active periods and those decision-making processes and the environment that will determine how uh, more or less how less heterothermic an animal will be or how more heterothermic an animal will be. And so we know that heterothermy saves energy. This has been shown in a study in 2014 on bats that shows that during these colder ambient temperatures, uh, bats will go into torpor much more frequently and more often. And torpor is just a more pronounced version of that hypothermia. In this same study, researchers used flow through respirometry on each individual bat in order to kind of develop an energy budget associated with each animal. And what they found is that in those lower mean ambient temperatures, when animals were going into torpor more often, they were saving up to 91% of the available energy to, those, uh, to them, as opposed to when they were in flight and being active. So we know that they're saving energy during those inactive periods. But when it comes to those active periods, we know that the risk plays a, plays a huge risk. And really, it's the risk of predation uh, that influences their activity. And so when it comes to small animals, not small nocturnal animals, they're not necessarily going to wait uh, to see a predator in order to determine if they're going to be active or not. But study after study has shown that for these nocturnal animals, moonlight um, and illumination just plays a huge role in how active they're going to be. And so this has been shown in a study in 2010 on gerbils, where during the waxing and full moon phases where the moon is above the horizon and much more likely to be brighter, these gerbils were taking less seeds from a given amount given to them by researchers within their enclosures. During the waning and new moon phases, when the moon is below the horizon and much more likely to be darker, uh, or just not as bright, uh, these gerbils were taking more risks to take more seeds from uh, that given amount. And then again, in a study from 1992 on Miriam's kangaroo rats found that during the full moon across the night, uh, these kangaroo rats were traveling less distances, as you can see there in the white, from their mound as opposed to the new moon. And so these inactive and active periods uh, really wouldn't make sense without understanding first the energy that's available to them um, in order for them to regulate those processes. And so we really need to look at the food quality as well. So when it comes to energy, fat plays a huge role um, in regulating their body temperature since fat is what's burned in order to fuel uh, changes in body temperature. So one of my favorite studies, uh, researchers were curious on the thermal regulation patterns of chipmunks in response to uh, their food quality. Three different groups of chipmunks were given um, consecutively higher fat content diets. A control group on the bottom there were allowed to feed on beet seeds that were available to them in their environment. Another group was allowed to feed on peanuts with higher fat content, and then another group with even higher fat content in the form of sunflower seeds. They took these seeds back into their burrows, hibernated, and then when they emerged, researchers followed their thermoregulatory patterns across time. And what they found is that those in the control group really varied their body temperatures. They were going into torpor much more frequently, and then in some of those February and March months, they were staying in torpor for longer periods of time. However, those that were given um, consecutively higher uh, qualities of diets, they found that they were actually varying their body temperatures much, much less. In fact, some of those in the uh, sunflower seed groups were becoming more homeothermic relative to those other counterparts. So that's cool. Now, understanding thermal regulation, and we know that energy is kind of what helps fuel thermal regulation, but one of the things that helps regulate thermal regulation is this little fancy hormone called corticosterone or CORT. So CORT is called the stress hormone, but it plays a much more important role in that in regulating homeostasis. Something that we're going through at this very period as you're listening to this talk. So the hypothalamus will uh, recognize necessary changes to homeostasis and via a series of neurotransmitters uh, down a pathway to the adrenal gland will release corticosterone into the body in order to mobilize those stored energy stores to help uh, uh, fuel or just to help regulate those daily processes throughout the day. Corticosterone and that circadian rhythm works also in, uh, in feedback inhibition where it'll downregulate that process when necessary. 
And so we can see this throughout time, for example, in a nocturnal rodent, oh, excuse me, where during the day, cortical sterone will be lower because it's inactive. And then during the night, cortical sterone will be released in higher and higher amounts into the, into, into the bloodstream in order to help regulate its daily activity necessary for it to do its thing at night. So it's really important. But now, Court can also, and this is why it's called the stress hormone sometimes, it can also mediate responses to extrinsic stressors. Um, during a given night, when court is just being released normally, an animal might experience an acute stressor and higher releases of corticosterone, for example, when it narrowly avoids being lunch meat for a predator. Corticosterone can also help mediate responses to chronic stressors, for example, drought and climate change. Uh, where court will be released in higher um, in higher amounts across time to help the animal kind of uh, acclimate to those external stressors. Now, one of the things that I haven't talked about yet is just body condition and how body condition can vary. Um, so I kind of briefly touched up on this when I talked about energy, but body condition can be measured in multiple different ways, such as like allometric scaling and other other ways, but for my thesis, I really focused on just fat, lean mass, and water, all of things that are really, really important in order to help provide resources for the animal to thermal regulate. But body condition can vary depending on multiple factors, such as uh, phenology, life history traits, stress, etc. To kind of show how it could vary, I'm going to look at two studies here, for example. In one study, Researchers were looking at the body condition of two populations of grizzly bears in uh, British Columbia. Over in the red there, they were looking at a population of grizzly bears that were located in more rural areas, closer to, um, closer to higher complex networks of roads. And these habitats were categorized by more homogenous resources available to them. And essentially determined that these habitats were a little of lower quality uh, for these bears. In another population, these bears were located in more fragmented areas with higher variability and more heterogeneity in those resources uh, with more resources available to them. And there was, those habitats were said to be in higher condition, or sorry, in higher quality. And so they followed their body condition in terms of weight, water, lean mass, and fat across the summer after these bears emerged from hibernation. And what they found is that although their body condition increased, those in those lower quality habitats had significantly lower body condition than those in the better quality habitat. Conversely, research, another group of researchers were looking at two breeding populations of kittiwakes on two different islands. One population, again in the red, um, were on an island that had lower foraging success and just lower uh, quality diets available to them. Another population of kittiwakes were on a different island with more foraging success and more heterogeneity in uh, those diets. And so they followed their body condition of these adults across the breeding season. And one of the things that they found was that there really was no difference in terms of their body condition across time. In each of these studies, researchers took it one step further and looked at the stress hormones associated with the environments that they were in. And they found something at least relatively consistent is that those corticosterone hormones were consistently higher in those populations in which uh, the environment was of lower quality, right? because these animals were experiencing just a little more stress where they needed to mobilize more energy um, in order just to function and do their daily activity. And so knowing the role of corticosterone, or I'm sorry, an another thing that I found is that in a lot of these studies, a lot of studies didn't necessarily find direct connections between corticosterone and body condition and really just associated corticosterone with, um, with the environment that they're in. And so we clearly need more of a method to kind of help uh, separate these relationships between environment, environment conditions, uh, body condition, and stress hormones. So knowing how corticosterone works, we can begin to ask the question of, can we separate drivers of homeostatic responses? We know that thermal regulation is determined a lot by the activity periods of the animal. We know that those ambient temperatures also play a role in determining how heterothermic or more heterothermic the animal will be. In terms of body condition, 
we know that the environment, such as uh, breeding season, phenology, life history traits, can have direct effects on body condition. We know that increased stress hormones can mobilize more energy and trigger responses in body condition. And we also know that the environment can increase stress hormones without necessarily affecting body condition. And so really, this is kind of the tough thing to do in a lot of um, environments, or sorry, in a lot of in situ studies, where it becomes pretty difficult to kind of disentangle all of these effects. And so I was lucky enough that in my study, I used these pharmacological implants of corticosterone to kind of help tease these things apart, which has mostly just been done in a lot of lab studies. So the goals of my thesis were really to do exactly that, disentangle the effects of environment from stress responses. My first chapter is uh, published in Scientific Reports. Give that a read whenever y'all have a chance. And it was again, on uh, disentangling the effects of environment and activity in the banner tail kangaroo rat. To do that, I measured the body temperature in banner tail kangaroo rats across the six month period. I considered the moon phases to assess for activity responses. I created these court implants to further differentiate between environmental and activity effects. And then as kind of a proof of concept, I validated these court implants via uh, fecal corticosterone metabolites. My second chapter was on elucidating body condition responses to these homeostatic perturbations, which again is in the form of those increased corticosterone implants that I gave them in the kangaroo rat. It's not published, but hopefully with some more long-term data and mixed with, um, with the implants that I made, we can maybe get some paper out of it. So that'd be cool. And again, for this chapter, I measured fat, percent fat, lean mass, and total body water, which are all really important um, resources within the animal to help fuel those homeostatic responses. I measured those over a three-month period in the kangaroo rat. And again, I created these court implants to uh, elucidate chronic stress responses. So before I kind of get into the, the methods of my first chapter, I want to go over some possible predictions <laughs> in terms of heterothermia. So we know in the desert and in the environment, especially across the summer, we know that the average daily temperature slowly rises across the summer and also becomes less variable across time. As the days get longer, the nights also get shorter. And so we know that the hours of darkness become shorter across time. And this is prime foraging time for the kangaroo rat. So we can make some predictions. If the daily temperature is becoming higher across time, it should therefore become a little easier for these kangaroo rats to maintain almost near higher levels of homeothermy across time because it's warmer. And therefore we would expect their heterothermy patterns to decrease. However, if their activity patterns and those complex decision-making processes due to the darkness is more important, and as darkness becomes shorter across time, we might predict their heterothermy patterns to increase as they're becoming much more inactive across time. So activity versus environment. And of course, to kind of accentuate these predictions, I pumped a group of kangaroo rats full of corticosterone to kind of help accentuate those responses. So, my site was at the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge in central New Mexico, right by the Rio Grande. Uh, specifically, it was in an area of five points uh, where the area is kind of categorized by a rich uh, heterogeneous um, vegetation in the form of creosote bushes, uh, a lot of forbs, a lot of grasses, <clears throat> and a lot of um, open barren land for these kangaroo rats to forage in. Specifically, I looked at the banner tail kangaroo rat. They're cute, they're small, they're highly active, and they're also likely misnamed since they're definitely not kangaroos and they're not even rats. They're actually more closely related to beavers. More importantly, is their role as seed cachers and distributors. They have these really, really cool external seed pouches in which they gather up their seeds, bring them back to their mounds, will distribute them or hide them. And essentially their role as distributors and cachers really make these, this species an ecosystem engineer and a keystone species. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So the desert is developed by a lot of biotic and abiotic factors, but research has shown that these small mammals play a huge role in developing the desert. Um, their burrows are really, really good in bringing in soil, much more healthier soil quality 
uh, as well as uh, diversity of vegetation increases in and around their, uh, their burrows. And when you consider that their home range sizes are only about 50 to 100, maybe even 200 meters away from that burrow, you can really kind of start to get this, um, an idea of how influential their home range sizes are. In order to collect their body temperature uh, data, I caught 26 kangarooettes using Sherman traps and split them up into two different groups, a treatment court group and a control group. With the help of a veterinarian, I implanted these high-frequency um, high data loggers, thermal, regula thermal regulation data loggers, into their central body cavity. I figured this was the area where I was going to get the most consistent body temperature data as, exposed, as opposed to an extremity. These uh, thermal sensitive data loggers record at around five minutes at a resolution of 0.0625 at, um, at an accuracy of 0 .0, uh, 0.5 degrees uh, centigrade. And so temperature just serves as a, it's an emerging property in, uh, and it's important in, because we can make a lot of inferences from body temperature in terms of their behavior and physiology, because again, it helps to it helps fuel those uh, active processes of an animal. After they were implanted with eye buttons, I implanted them with their uh, with their treatment. Those in the control group, if you look on the bottom, was simply just a silicone silicone implant, a porous silicone implant, and nothing more. But those in the court group were implanted with a silicone implant with these corticosterone pellets inside that contain around 160 milligrams per kilogram per body weight. Based on a lot of previous studies on animals of this size with uh, these, these types of nocturnal patterns, this was considered to be a moderate dose for these animals compared to their baseline. Uh, I did an in vitro study before I developed these implants and I found that the release rate was around 2,800 nanograms per milliliter per hour. And so again, my attempt with these implants was to, to try to kind of elevate these uh, natural baseline court patterns to something a little more, something more mild, but chronic across time. And this study ran from March of 2019 through August of 2019. And again, it's kind of like a proof of concept. I also tested these court implants in a different uh, set of kangaroo rats in the summer where I caught 25 kangaroo rats. I'll also give 10 of the results after I show you what I did here, but um, uh, I caught 25 kangaroo rats via Sherman traps. And when I caught them, I collected their fecal pellets and their fecal pellets um, were for me to analyze their fecal cord metabolites. After I collected their fecal pellets, I implanted them with their respective treatment, released them back to their burrows. And then I recaptured them at one, six and seven weeks post implants. Uh, and each time I collected fecal pellets. I then um, grounded up these fecal pellets into a fine dust, threw them through an assay in order to get their, um, uh, their corticosterone levels in those fecal pellets. And so just to kind of show you quickly the results of what I found is that these implants worked. I knew they were working beforehand, but it was nice to see that they were working out in the field, is that across time, those control individuals um, uh, had lower corticosterone in those fecal pellets compared to the court treated uh, individuals. So now, Moving on to uh, my data analysis. First, in order to determine activity, I had to determine the modal active body temperature. And this is the body temperature that the animals were most in most frequently during their active periods. So these eye buttons were recording at five minutes. So I had a lot of data to work with and I threw all of that data onto a histogram. And so because these uh, kangaroo rats have a pretty distinct uh, active and inactive phases, the data was always distributed bimodally. And you can easily tell when they were active versus when they were inactive. And so really, I got this modal active body temperature in order to kind of establish a reference point of their activity in order to measure variation against that point. And so once I got their modal active body temperature, I did this pretty much for every individual. Once I got their modal active body temperature, it was time to start measuring that variation against that. Um, and for that, I used the heterothermy index. And this was really, uh, again, for me to kind of measure the deviation away from that active body temperature down to their inactive phases. And so to do that, the heterothermy index equation 
um, is really just the equation for standard deviation, except um, instead of using mean body temperature, I use the more biologically relevant modal body temperature as that reference point. And so because it works like standard deviation, essentially I'm measuring uh, the time away from that modal active body temperature, as well as the degree away from that modal active body temperature. Once I had their activity time and their, uh, sorry, once I had that modal active body temperature and heterothermy index, it was time for me to start measuring their total activity time per night. So if you kind of zoom in on one of these uh, body temperature profiles, um, I determined the start of activity to be whenever an animal was within uh, half of a degree of their modal active body temperature. And I considered the end of activity to be whenever the animal cooled down past that half a degree of modal active body temperature. And again, this was, as a reminder, this was done per animal per night uh, in total. Once I had their total activity time, I took the moon phases into account because we know this is a big driver of those activity periods. So as a reminder, during the waxing moon, the sun will set and the moon will remain above the horizon until at some point during the night, the moon will set, at which point kangaroo rats come out and do their thing. And at some point the next day, the sun will rise. During the waning moon, the sun will set and it's usually immediately dark. And at some point during the night, the moon will rise and stay above the horizon the next day after sunrise. So I took their total activity periods per night during each of those moon phases. And then I also considered the starts and stops of activity. For the start, I considered the start of activity uh, when animals reached that modal active body temperature after complete darkness. And this is for both the waxing and waning moon phases. I considered the ends of activity when animals cool down past that uh, uh, past their modal active body temperatures before the sunrise. So. In order for me to analyze the heterothermy index, I use a repeated measures linear mixed model, determine the best covariance structure using Akaiki information criterion. I use day treatment and a treatment day effect as fixed effects and the individual as a random effect. For their activity periods, I use a repeated measures linear mixed model, but I analyze the total activity per night, the beginning and end as separate models. I use a treatment moon phase and a treatment moon phase uh, as fixed effects and individual as a random effect. So what I found is first and foremost, their active, their modal active body temperatures were actually pretty similar. When they warmed up into activity, they were pretty much warming up to the same active body temperature. However, the biggest difference was found is that those court-treated individuals had actually had higher heterothermy indices across the summer. And this was a highly significant effect. And most of these patterns were actually driven more by the time spent below the active, uh, active below their modal active body temperature as opposed to deviation away from it. Uh, and it's not really show, I don't really show it here, but their minimum body temperatures actually decrease by around half a degree or so across the summer. And so it's a mixture of these slightly lower minimum body temperatures and the increases in heterothermy that show that activity time plays a much more important role uh, than an ambient temperatures do. So then what was kind of interesting was that for some reason in late April through mid-May, there was this sharp decrease in heterothermy indices. Um, and I don't really know what happened there because I wasn't out there, but um, the fact that it happened in both groups kind of suggests that it was something environmental or phenological. So I kind of split the model up into uh, just two different sets before and after that event, and the results were still the same. There was still a highly significant effect of my treatment in terms of their heterothermy indices. When it comes down to their activity per night, you can kind of start to make some predictions about what's going on if um, uh, utilizing these heterothermy indices. And so control animals were active around 368 minutes per night, and court animals were active around 342 minutes per night. And this was a highly significant difference between those two. When it came to the starts and ends of activity, during the waxing moon phase, control individuals were uh, warming up to that active body temperature a little sooner, 136 minutes, compared to the court-treated individuals, but this difference wasn't significant. 
However, when it came to the ends of activity, poor treated individuals were cooling down below that active body temperature 140 minutes uh, as opposed to 102 minutes for the control individuals. And this was a significant difference between those two. During the waning moon phase after the sun sets and there's immediate darkness, both individuals were cooling or were warming up to that active body temperature at nearly identical rates. And this difference wasn't significant. However, again, the biggest difference came when it came down to cooling down. And those court individuals started cooling down 224 minutes uh, below the sunrise as opposed to those control individuals. And this was a highly significant effect. So really these patterns were like were being uh, we're being seen much more frequently at the ends of activity. So to kind of summarize some of these take homes is first and foremost, the implants worked, which is kind of cool because this probably could have been a different talk had they not worked. But nonetheless, I probably would have been able to infer some things about this. And this is kind of cool because uh, these implants and these pharmacological implants have scarcely been used in situ. Again, we usually see this more in lab work. So I'm kind of really excited that these implants were actually doing something out in the field. Uh, second, another take home is that these ambient temperatures play a minor role uh, while activity is much more important. And again, it was kind of cool to show that even across the summer, their minimum, their, their minimum body temperature were actually slightly lower uh, than what we expected. And of course, uh, treatment decreased the overall activity of those that were implanted with cord implants. And the difference was mostly during the ends of activity, uh, presumably because at first the animals are coming out and assessing whether there's risk or not, and then they determine after that whether they should cool down past uh, those active body temperatures. And again, the differences was in the time spent below their active uh, mobile active body temperature as opposed to the deviation away from that. So some of the bother impacts, um, I didn't actually show this image earlier in my methods and I probably should have, but this is actually an aerial view of my field site. And what's cool about this is that you can actually see these kangaroo rat mounds from Google Earth. Um, the kangaroo mounds are in those barren white patches that you see there. And so you can kind of get an idea of where they are and what their influence can be in an environment. If you know that kangaroo rats are active within 50 to 100 meters of uh, their burrows, and again, this isn't really the scale that I try to make it to, you can kind of get an idea of what their influence will be in their environment. So if we know they're being, you know, X amount of active when they're not stressed, and we know that stress reduces their activity time, we can almost expect to see them become more heterothermic and their, and their home range sizes actually become less as they're likely um, triggering a predatory response to just being less active over time. And knowing that they play a huge role as ecosystem engineers, we can kind of begin to make inferences and ask more questions about what happens when their activity time becomes lower. Um, after looking through the literature, I found that when you exclude ecosystem engineers and keystone species like these kangaroo rats from a desert ecosystem, that heterogeneous vegetation actually becomes much more dominated by grasses over time, therefore losing some vegetation diversity. So that's kind of cool. So moving on to body condition, um, again, as kind of a reminder, uh, the environment just can play multiple roles in determining uh, body condition. Uh, we know that body condition can directly affect your stress hormones, again, via just phenology, their life history traits, what they're going through at that time. Uh, we know that the quality of habitat can play direct roles on body condition. But not a lot of research has been done on these direct relationships between the stress hormones and body condition. And so my goal here was essentially to, again, kind of eliminate the environmental stressor and get straight to the stress response. And so my prediction was that if these stress hormones are playing a role in mobilizing more energy uh, to initiate more of a stress response, I would, uh, I, think I would make these predictions kind of similar to what we saw in that bear study earlier, where core treated individuals would actually have less body condition in terms of their fat, lean mass, weight, et cetera, while control individuals would have higher body condition. So to go through my methods, again, back at the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge, literally right next to my first chapter study site, I captured 14 kangaroo rats. And again, I measured their fat, 
percent mass, uh, percent fat, lean mass, and total body water. And I measured it via quantitative magnetic resonance. This is a really, really cool and novel way to measure body condition that is super, super highly accurate because it's essentially an MRI machine. Um, and it's something that I recommend a lot of researchers to start utilizing, especially for if they're working with small enough mammals. Um, and the way it works is you shove an animal into a holding tube and you put a holding plunger in it and you stick it into the MR, the QMR machine. It'll scan for about three or four minutes. And then about four minutes later, it spits out a fresh kangaroo rat and fresh data here, uh, fresh raw data in terms of fat, lean, and free water. So for my methods for this, I um, in June of 2019, I captured those 14 kangaroo rats, put them up in a control and court group. I then QMR them immediately afterwards, bring when I brought them back to the lab. I then implanted them with either a control or court implant. I then, uh, about a month later, I recaptured, uh, what was that, 13 kangaroo rats and stuck them back through the QMR. And then almost a month after that as well, I recaptured 10 kangaroo rats and stuck them through the QMR. And so for my analysis, I look at the fat, percent fat, lean mass, and total body water as kind of a global model. And I threw them into a multivariate analysis of variates. I determined the best covariance structure using Akaiki information criterion. And I used a total length of um, a total length of the study at 47 days uh, as a fixed effect, treatment, and a treatment day effect uh, as fixed effects. I used individual as a random effect. And then just kind of as like a post hoc test, I split that global model up into uh, univariate tests on fat, percent fat, and lean mass and total body water. And again, I used a repeated measure general linear mixed model, and I use the same fixed effects as well as the same random effect. And so what I found was that in terms of that global model, there was absolutely no significant difference in terms of treatment on, uh, on their body condition. When looking at their those individual univariate models afterwards, there were also no main effects on fat, percent fat, and et cetera. However, time was a significant driver of these body condition patterns, thereby probably kind of hinting that the environment or whatever they're going through across that summer likely plays more of a role in determining their body condition. And then in hindsight, after kind of analyzing and uh, dealing with all this, oops, um, I realized that all of these indices were actually auto-correlated with each other since they all came from the same individuals. So in the future, I definitely would like to just look at just their uh, fat and percent fat, since those are their energy stores, as well as maybe their body weight. And so after scouring the literature, it seems that environment likely plays more of a role, although I might have some reservations with that, which I'll get to just in a bit. And so... What I found is first and foremost is just that these life history traits are playing a huge role. On other studies on kangaroo rats as well as uh, banner tails, I find that although kangaroo rats breed across the entire season, they're mostly breeding during uh, the spring months uh, before a steep drop off in reproductive state and going into the dry season. On studies on other nocturnal rodents that have similar daily patterns, I found that uh, in terms of their energy reserves and fat mass, uh, during the breeding season, they start off with a lot of fat before a sharp decline in fat mass across that breeding season. And it's likely just because breeding is an energetically expensive process. And then once the dry season starts, they slowly start to accumulate fat mass across time. And this was pretty consistent in all the literature that I was able to find. And in each of these studies, and most of the studies that, uh, that I found to confirm this, this coincided with the growth of primary productivity during the breeding season, followed by in during the dry season, most of this pro productivity comes to seed. And presumably what's happening is that after the breeding season, these animals are then foraging on all that vegetation that comes to seed and therefore likely influencing their fat masses. Uh, on a few studies that I found on uh, corticosterone and uh, the environment, I found that in a lot of these in a lot during a lot of these reproductive states, corticosterone is usually highest during the breeding season because again, it's an energetically expensive process, and cord is just needed in higher amounts in order to help fuel those activities before a steep drop off. So it's likely that my implants 
probably weren't enough to kind of overseed those seasonal patterns. Sorry, to overtake those seasonal patterns. But nonetheless, even though they weren't significant, some trends were still kind of hinted at here. Uh, and the first is that although I made a prediction that my core treated individuals would have a lower body condition, the hint here is that, uh, for example, if you look at fat mass as an example here, fat was higher than those control individuals. And this was the same for all of those body condition indices. And so that hint was there. But the reason I probably wasn't able to detect the difference is one probably is the sample size or the length of time. There's a lot of phenological and just um, uh, life history traits that are playing a role here. And again, because I only sampled 10 individuals by the end of it, and I only sampled the 14 individuals three different times, it's likely that my sample size wasn't big enough to really detect the change. But then why would my results have been opposite compared to what I expected? And I realized that probably is the results of my first chapter that were playing a role, is that these increased heterothermy in those individuals that were stressed more are likely saving enough energy to actually accumulate, um, have higher body condition across time. I mentioned that bat study earlier, but there's actually multiple studies that show that even slight deviations away from that active body temperature can have significant energy, in, uh, uh, energy impacts on the animal. So that's likely what was happening here, but still that kind of leaves us with more questions for the future. Uh, if, for example, what are the consequences of saving more energy via stress, but being less active across time? What are the fitness consequences of, of these patterns? How is the role of these ecosystem engineers influenced by stress? So if there are any undergrads listening to this talk right now, this could be the project for you. So to conclude, I kind of want to give a quick summary. And what we learn is that stress manipulation can help to eliminate or separate the effects of extrinsic stressors on animals to get to more of a mechanistic approach to studying physiological changes. In my case, thermal regulation and energy allocation by body condition. Changes to thermal regulation likely has profound effects on an animal's behavior in terms of how much they're foraging or defending territory. And again, uh, although I didn't explicitly test for what environmental conditions my kangaroo rats were experiencing, it's likely that increase in corticosterone was making them le take less risks than their control counterparts. Perhaps they simply felt stressed enough to initiate a predatory avoidance response. Nonetheless, the reduced activity could potentially have these negative fitness consequences as well as consequences for the environment. And so because of those bigger uh, consequences, I can talk about this, where this experiment was a small part of a larger project evaluating the knock-on effects of manipulating homeostatic stress responses in the kangaroo rat. Considering the kangaroo rats are ecosystems engineers in their habitat, my goal was to establish a mechanistic link between animal physio physiology via stress manipulation. So I looked at thermal regulation and body condition, but future studies can look at metabolism, osmoregulation, and anything else that's really important in determining an animal's activity. Further studies can go past this physiology and then see how that affects their behavior in terms of foraging, consumption, and caching. And they can track this uh, specifically through just advances in technology, pit tagging technology, telemetry technology, you name it. And then if we can determine changes to their behavior, to spe their specific behavior and their specific role on the environment, we can kind of begin to create more of a feedback loop back into the environment. And we can track that actually via stable isotopes. So we're kind of just creating this, uh, uh, this big feedback loop, again, by studying stress manipulation as that mechanistic link that ties it all together. And so with that, I want to end with my acknowledgments. I want to thank the Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge, the Sevieta Long-Term Ecological Research Site, my colleague, Nikki Walker, as well as uh, my techs and helpers, Mikey Deutsch and Jason Dallas. Uh, I want to thank my, uh, the superb, my superb uh, scholarship and all the friends I made at SIU. Um, if, if you're all are listening, I want to thank my committee, Justin, Robin, and Jason. Thank you for helping me to get to this point. And of course, uh, I want to thank my mom. I don't think she's listening. She doesn't know how to use a computer. But um, I want to thank my SIU pals. And of course, my girlfriend, Katie Ekoff, who came to visit me out in the uh, 
during my field season, we took a trip to Arizona. Um, and I want to thank, of course, her dog, uh, Nanook, and Kaiser, who I got my first month of grad school and who has now just grown into the biggest lovable boy who probably outweighs me. And so with that, I will take any questions.